There's a headline on Biz News which goes back to May 2019, and it reads, A good man stands firm while the rogues run free. The good man referred to is former KZN head of the Hawks, General Johan Boysen, a straight cop who, as we wrote at the time, was suspended three times, arrested, jailed. Imagine what that was like for a a general to be put amongst uh, jailbirds. Charged and only years later, finally exonerated. General Boysen also stood firm against high-level politicians and the then police commissioner, plus a rogue cop colonel who attempted to sting him by putting almost one and a half million rand in cash in the boot of his car. The man himself is with us in the Biz News studio. General, welcome. Uh, It sounds like a movie script. I know you have written a book. Has anybody approached you for rights yet? Uh, Good morning, Eric. Thank you for having me. Well, we've we've done the book. um, I didn't write it myself. I co-wrote it with with Jessica Pitchford. Um, I I probably would would have gone in too much detail if I'd done the book myself. So she very thankfully helped me to to do the book. Yes, and apparently there were talks from from Netflix. Uh, They approached Jessica. I don't know how far that's gone but I'm focusing on other areas now. And I'm delighted to hear Jessica's doing so well. She was a colleague of mine at the SABC, would you believe, in 91, 92, 93. Wow. Well done, Jess. Uh, what are you doing now? Well, presently, Alec, um, since I retired from the police, um, I'm heading the uh, investigation uh, component with Infidelity Security. Uh, I'm the National Aid for Investigations of Fidelity Security. It sounds like uh, it's an, perhaps if anything, an even more interesting role than what you had at the police services? Well, it's basically an extension of what I did in the police. Um, um, I, I joined for that fidelity because of the uh, yeah, cash and transit high set were getting out of control, um, but I'm also assisting in other areas of the investigation component. I'm actually managing the investigations. It's interesting this because there is definitely a move towards the private sector getting much more involved in areas where in the past the state had a monopoly and, uh, well, crime, we know we know how uh, the criminals are thriving in South Africa at the moment and we're seeing increasingly um, that this is happening. Just before we go into a little bit more detail, what are you hoping to achieve by talking to us today? Now, Alec, um, this has been an ongoing saga for since 2011 and it's only as recent as 2019 that Myself and the Cato Manor detectives were eventually exonerated after all charges were withdrawn by the present uh, in the NDPP head, uh, Advocate Shamana Victoria. Um, as we speak, um, I'm pres- presently engaging with uh, outside counsel that had been appointed by the state uh, after my evidence at the commission, uh, Zonda Commission, requiring to state capture. Um, and I've been approached by a, a number of people to, uh, in the past couple of years, to 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 to, to vent my my views and with, with regards to what had, had happened over the last couple of years. But I think the time has now come that I uh, uh, this whole thing was spawned by an uh, article in the Sunday Times newspaper, and I recently started to write my own articles to to put the record straight. Although the media themselves um, had soon picked up that there was something amiss in this whole saga because it wasn't only my story, it was the Sars Roque story, it was the rendition, Zimbabwe rendition story. The, that was the trilogy of, of stories that were run by the Sunday Times at the time that they eventually and ultimately led to almost the investigation of, of, of the Hawks and the investigative component at, at Sars. And it also led to the demise of uh, General Anwar Dramat, who headed the Hawks at the time, he ultimately resigned from, from the police. Incredibly destructive. Who was behind it? Do you have any idea? Because the reporters clearly must have thought that they had the truth. Someone must have given them some information. So, Alec, um, when, when I did the book with Jessica, it was really difficult to put your, my finger on one specific individual to say this. So, I, I tried to explain it. There were different protagonists with different agendas with a common goal, and that, that created almost a, a melting pot of, 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 of people that 
ultimately wanted to uh, get their own agendas, proceed with their own agendas. But what had happened at the time is we were busy with a multi-million rand corruption investigation between a businessman in KwaZulu-Natal and a police procurement section in KwaZulu-Natal. And that investigation uh, eventually led to uh, connected, well, the, the businessman was connected to politicians and well, I mentioned them of look, the person that uh, was a silent partner of of this businessman was Edward Zuma at the time, the son of the then uh, state president. And I think that's where things started to go away for myself. Um, no sooner had uh, we started the investigation and I froze some of the, the assets that were still had to be paid out, I think it was 15 million rand. Edward came to see me and I refused to release the money and from there it was just, um, things just went awry for me. Sure, and Jacob Zuma is now back on the scene in South Africa with probably a 10% of the national vote. It, the mind boggles, but we, we've also recently had, not just Jacob Zuma coming on the scene, uh, we've recently had the forced disclosure of ANC CADA deployment documents, which tell us that there's a, a little cabal, a little group in Latuli House, which decides who gets what jobs in the public sector, which is one third of the economy. It's, it's actually frightening to me when uh, someone who understands a little bit about the way an economy works, that you've got this little communist style Politburo that does it. Did you, did you, and what you've said now, it shows how deep those tentacles go. And of course you have um, spoken at the Zondo commission itself. So there's, there's lots of documentary evidence, but during your time, in the SAPS and all the years that you worked from a Bobby on the beat to, to being the head of KZN investigations, really, did you see much CADA deployment? Our first experience of CADA uh, deployment was with the appointment of uh, Jackie Silevis and National Commission of Police, which we now know was a disaster. Um, he ended up in jail himself. Um, later on, the, the point of the Ria Pieja, which I think was even a, a bigger disaster, but the problem with cater deployment, and I'm talking about the police, we can also talk about cater deployment uh, that's recently been exposed with the Judge Schroepe saga in the Western Cape. Um, but within the police, the problem with cater deployment, it eventually trickles down to, to lower levels as well. Because if we have a, a, a national commissioner who's, who's a cater, um, it, she would be appointing her, her favorites. That trickles down to, to, to micro level. And unfortunately, uh, and that's my view, uh, that's what's happening in the police, uh, your uh, middle management especially, uh, well, I've been affected by, by cater deployment higher up. Of course, eventually you have people appointed in, 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 in managerial posts that are not up, up to the job. Ian Cameron, who's a, an activist, who I'm sure you, you're aware of his work, he, he says that there are hundreds now of generals in the police who were just put there because it's a it's a it's a well paid job which it should be, but they were put there by uh, because of their political connections. Is there any way of of uh, of giving us perspective on how many generals there were, perhaps while you were serving versus today, and how many of the generals in percentage terms would have been appointed there? because of their political connections rather than the fact that they worked their way through the ranks? Well, pre-democracy in 1995, you basically had one or two or three generals at national headquarters in Pretoria, and you would have brigadiers in the provinces um, like, taking care of the provinces. Um, I don't know the number of generals that are in the police now, but I know it's quite a substantial number. And if you take into account the salaries that generals earn, I mean, you can just go and Google what they earn, it takes a, a huge cut from the budget of SEPSA. My personal uh, view is that there are too many generals, too many chiefs. Ian said something like 200 at the last count. So we've gone from three to 200. That's extraordinary. No, well, it's, uh, it could be. I don't know the numbers, but I know there's, there's a large number um, of generals in the police. I think there are far too many generals. And, and what about... The honest cops, because like a nurse and a teacher, I suppose journalists as well, it's a calling. 
you don't go to become a policeman so that you can make money. You go there for uh, to serve a higher purpose. Surely there are still many honest cops in the SAPS. How did they, having seen your story, how, what advice would you give them for the way that they should go about their lives? I think fortunately I still engage with a lot of policemen through the nature of the, the work I'm presently doing uh, at Fidelity. There are still a number of honest policemen and dedicated policemen, so I'm, I'm very uh, mindful not to paint all with the same brush. Um, I encounter them on a daily basis, but they're also getting despondent. Um, if I take my own example, for instance, it was not only myself that was targeted in the investigation. There was a lot of collateral damage. The whole Cato Manor unit basically became Cato, uh, collateral damage um, after I was being targeted. Um, and it makes it very difficult. You know, if, if you're a policeman and you see what can happen to a general if you if you uh, have the temerity to, to, to start investigating senior police officers, what could happen to you? I think that makes them think twice before they will embark on, on the process of investigating politicians and, and senior police officers. You've mentioned Cato Manor a couple of times. Not everybody's followed the story. Take us through it. So basically, Alec, I was the, the uh, provincial head of the walks in KwaZulu Natal. I had various units reporting to me. Now, Cato Manor, the way they were portrayed was a, a separate unit that reported directly to me, which, which wasn't true. They, they, uh, Cato Manor was a unit, which is part of the Durban Organized Crime Unit. It's a subsection of the Durban Organized Crime Unit dealing with uh, violent crimes. Um, and I had various other subsections in the, the rest of the province as well that dealt with violent crimes. Um, so during a period of, I think, probably four or five years, there were a number of shootings in which suspects died. Um, and the majority of those, not the majority, every single one of those were, being, were investigated by uh, IPID at the time, um, the independent directive of, uh, 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 they investigate police, uh, where the policemen, uh, involve themselves with crime or shootings like this. So they were all investigated thoroughly by the by IPAD um, So what happened is there were a few things that happened with myself when the investigation started. I was told to stop the investigation, which I did not do. Then they tried to bribe me by putting uh, one and a half million rand in my car, and I had them arrested for that. Then the Sunday Times story came out, and we established afterwards they were... Um, Elements within crime intelligence um, that had le- uh, uh, leaked this information to, to to the Sunday Times at the time, uh, the journalist at the time that approached me was Stefan Hofstadter, um, and the same applies to the the the, the Sars Rogue story and the uh, Zimbabwe rendition stories. Uh, ultimately, the Cato Manor detectives were arrested, and I was arrested with them because they couldn't find any dirt on me. That they established a charge of racketeering. And if you have a, 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 an enterprise, there must be a manager of the enterprise. So they selected me as the, as the manager of the so-called enterprise at the time. And from being just doing your job and trying to, to uh, serve South Africa's greater interest, you ended up in jail. How did that happen? Well, so adequate, you know, what happened is I got wind of the story long before they arrested me. Um, when they announced that the, the, the Sunday Times article was going to be investigated, I actually opened my door to the investigators, but I soon realized that something else was going on. They investigated every aspect of my, my life, my, uh, my income tax, my, they, uh, all my uh, petrol claims that I'd submitted over the years. They, uh, every single informant claim that I'd approved in the past, that was scrutinized. And I think in all probability, you know, I think it was one of Stalin's uh, henchmen at, at the time when that said, uh, show me the the man, I'll find you the crime. And I think they, they wanted to find something on me to neutralize me and the investigations. And when they couldn't find something, um, they then went and said, okay, let's see if we can find something on the, on the, the POCA Act, the Prevention of Organized Crime Act. And then they saw the racketeering charges, uh, which, which could be a bit draconian, the racketeering charges, because it allows a certain evidence that, uh, that, is admissible in, in court. That's not not normally uh, admissible, which made it much much easier for them to prosecute someone that's not directly involved with the operations of the enterprise. 
So ultimately, um, as I said, I got wind of the story and I told them long, well, through my lawyer, I presented myself that I'm prepared to hand myself over. They ensured me that they don't want to arrest me until finally, ultimately, they did arrest me. I was chucked in the cells with a couple of my colleagues, uh, taken to court, and we were released on bail. Um, I took the matter on review. Charges were drawn off the court, held that there was no evidence against me. And then when Sean Abrams became the national head of public prosecutions, he reauthorized my prosecutions. Prosecution, I was arrested again, chucked into jail, taken to court, kept in the holding cells, and then up into the court uh, room where I was released on bail once again. It's an extraordinary story, and yours has been. What is, where's your, your North Star? What's your guiding principle? You know, quite often when people um, get attacked, and as you say, show me the man, I'll show you the crime, I'll find the crime, uh, there's something somewhere, some skeleton in some cupboard. W- what ensured, what, what, how do you live your life in such a way that uh, you're clearly a Boy Scout? They couldn't find anything. I've, I've always been mindful, and I always used to tell the detectives I had to work with me, there are a few things that can get you into trouble. And one of those things are taking shortcuts. And I always ensured, and the, I mean, when they started checking the, the, the informer claims that I'd approved, I didn't even bother to to contact the clerks at work with it to tell them, make sure your files are in order. Because I was a stickler for sticking to the rules, the treasury rules. So I knew when it came to... Um, exhibits, state money and things like that. They could do what they want. They, they, they wouldn't find anything. Um, and to answer your question on, on a different level, um, what was my North Star? And I, we spoke about it earlier on. Unfortunately today, for the majority of policemen, it's become a job and not a calling. Um, I always wanted to be a policeman. I left school. I would... I was approached by various people in the private sector through the course of my career to go to the private sector. But I always wanted to be a policeman. Was was a calling, and I think that was my my guiding north star. It's interesting. I, I think there are many people in in my profession who believe it's honourable. Um, no, sorry, we don't we don't have a profession. We have a craft. Uh, who believe it's honourable, but there are other people who are around for a job and what they can get out of it. And I guess it's it's like that in in many of these. In the most recent past, though, because it's quite interesting listening to you talking about that you you dotted the I's and crossed the T's. Andre de Reiter was an interesting guy. Uh, not too many people know this, but his brother told me, Jan told me, that when Andre was at school, he took typing as a subject. Now, I don't know if you remember, I think you went to Port Natal, didn't you? Port Natal and guess what? Yeah. Uh, there's no way that uh, that... 99% of boys would have gone into the typing class, which was all girls. And yet Andre had the sense to do that. So he could touch type. And so he would sit in meetings at Eskom and touch type the information, um, dotting his I's and crossing his T's. So he had it all there. Did you have anything to do with the rater? Because when, when one reads his book and looks at what's going on there and the criminality that was going on at Eskom, it kind of boggles the mind. I think I was approached, I think, in May that, uh, in 20, what's 24, 20, 22, I was approached by the current National Commission of Police who wanted to, uh, uh, to come back to the police on a contract basis to head the investigations uh, into corruption at ESCOM. I agreed, and unfortunately, that did not come to pass. And then last year in February, I was approached by the Minister of Police, Mr. Minister Becky Kede. He came to see me in the Western Cape and asked me if I was still prepared to do it, and I agreed. Um, but I insisted on a contract in which I wanted to ensure that and I told him as much. I said to him, I, did, I did, do not want to um, be settled up with the problems that under the right had to, to, to face. Um, he agreed to that. Unfortunately, through no fault of mine, that did not come to pass either. I did meet with Andre on a few occasions. We had discussions. Um, he was very happy that I was going to be on board. But as I said, unfortunately, through no fault of mine, uh, it, it never um, came to pass that I had an investigation at ESCOM. I wrote to the minister, I think it was in March last year, 
when the contract was not forthcoming, in which I wanted certain things to be, uh, uh, where I stipulated certain aspects, um, I wrote to the minister and told him that unfortunately, and, and just at, at the same time, Andre had the interview with Hanneke Larsen, and I then, uh, I actually had an agreement with a few news media that they would uh, keep back on the story to allow me to, to proceed with the investigation because I didn't want them to uh, awake sleeping dogs. I'd taken the, uh, even my present employer, um, the CEO, uh, Mr. Val Bartman, the ex-Rugby Springbok player, he was on board with it. Um, he was going to sit on me for, for the two years because they, we all realized the importance of sorting out the corruption that is formed. But unfortunately, in, in May last year, I had to write to the minister and tell them I'm not available any longer because by then the horse had bolted and it would have been very difficult for me to uh, uh, make any headway on an investigation then. And what were you guys going to charge, Eskim? And this is an important question because there's so all numbers of allegations of what the investigators who did operate there were paid. So I was going to be appointed on a contract basis at with with a salary of a police general, so it, it the, the taxpayer would have footed the bill for him for, for that for my salary, and and that was that. I'd already um, recruited a number of investigators with SAPS, competent investigators. Most of them um, had just finalised their work in the Zondo Commission of Inquiry, so and I knew quite a few of them. Um, one of them was a Brigadier Jack Berger, um, very competent in in. in managing these type of investigations as well. He managed the, the investigations or, or the investigators in the in the Zondo Commission of Inquiry. So he was on board. Um, a few other colonels who were on board. I'd already spoken off the record to a uh, prosecutor or two. I'd spoken to officially off the record. I spoke to people from the investigative directorate that we were all prepared to come on board. Um, so from... from uh, Payment point of view, I, I, I know the, the 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 story about the previous national commissioner uh, George Fivers that he had done an investigation, and I think that's where the controversy came in. But from from my point of view, I would only been paid a pay salary. It is interesting that uh, you'd put a bit of a dream team together uh, to solve or to at least investigate real issues at ESCO, and I'm pretty sure you would have uh, uncovered some uh, damning evidence. There's a lot of it in Dorator's book already. And there are people on the other side who would be looking at this and saying, mm, let's block it, probably through the Cater Deployment Committee. So that was an easy way to do it. And then secondly, let's get rid of this uh, irritation called General Johan Boyson. Do, have you had attempts on your life or... or um, um, in anything that you you could see that you know, like Andre Dorator's uh, attempted poisoning. I think it was precisely because of that reason that I insisted on having certain uh, things written into the contract to avoid having you experience the same things that Andre Dorator experienced, and uh, that's that's precisely how I wanted that uh, documented in the contract. With regard to threats to my life, there wasn't. Uh, which I initially thought might have been an attempt, but my own investigations um, tells me that it was a uh, hijacking, uh, attempted hijacking gone wrong when they uh, when there's an attempt on, on myself in, in Victoria about two about three years ago. And looking ahead for this wonderful country that we love and live in, despite all of the challenges on a day to day basis, do you see any bright spots on the horizon for South Africa? Alec, we just got to make it work. We don't have a choice. I said to a friend of mine who asked me a question on a WhatsApp message a couple of days ago, well, do I see any hope? But I, I said to her, we just got to make it work. And if we look across the globe, I mean, well, what's happening in Europe, what's happening in the US, we, what's happening in the Mideast, we still live in the relative peace and uh, we can still have a, a, a nice bri. I, I went abroad a couple of weeks ago and if you look at the meat prices or to dine out, so we're still, uh, we're still having it reasonably good in South Africa. I'm very positive. We have to be positive. Indeed we do. General Johan Boysen uh, is with ADT Fidelity, and I'm Alec Hogg from biznews.com. 